Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar on uh, monetizing your open banking APIs. Um, this is a, a follow up uh, to the blog post that we did uh, last month uh, on uh, three API led strategies to woo first class uh, fintechs. Um, so, uh, a, a few uh, housekeeping announcements before we start. Um, do uh, feel free to ask any questions using the questions window anytime, and I'll uh, try to take those questions as we go on or right at the end on the uh, at the Q&A session. Um, and uh, uh, thanks for joining in once again. So let's uh, get started. Uh, so my name is Vidura Gamini Abe. I, uh, am, I work as the Senior Director Solutions Architecture uh, at WSO2. Uh, I work with uh, multiple banks uh, in Europe in implementing uh, uh, WSO2 open banking uh, and uh, other financial uh, services companies in general. Uh, joining me for this uh, webinar is also uh, Imad Rizni, who's a solutions engineer with uh, the solutions architecture team as well. Uh, he will be assisting me with the, the demo parts of the, the webinar. Right, so let's get started. Um, so open banking has been there uh, now for a few years and it's uh, taking up the world uh, as a, like a storm. Um, and uh, I hope uh, all of you uh, who are attending this know what open banking is about. Uh, basically, open banking is about um, sharing your account and payment details uh, with the with the right uh, end user consent uh, with third parties uh, using open APIs. Uh, and uh, this uh, this concept has, like I said, has been there for a while now, um, and uh, different parts of the world refer to this in different ways. Um, so here's a map of um, the countries that are currently doing open banking in uh, some form or the other. Uh, this list is obviously constantly growing, um, and uh, some of the countries who have been having this concept for a while are also now thinking of uh, you know making these as proper uh, regular uh, you know regulated uh, ways of sharing data like uh, for example in the US the last just last week um, two major regulators the consumer finance protection bureau and the uh, federal deposit insurance corporation they they took some noteworthy steps towards considering data sharing rules and uh, promoting banks and fintechs uh, collaborating on technology um, and uh, so open banking, like I said, is is a is this trend uh, goes by the name open banking um, uh, or, or uh, with a with a term that is in line with open data concepts uh, in uh, in different parts of the world. But uh, in in essence, it's it's pretty much the same across the world. Um, and the the pillars that it is built on top of, uh, like uh, how you know share data is shared. Uh, and uh, the fact that you need to get users consent uh, for that and all of that um, remains as the same across the across the globe. Um, so uh, yeah, and and this has been pioneered primarily uh, in in Europe. Uh, UK is the is the forefront of actually implementing some of these and uh, really um, progressing with it quite well. Um, so the UK is the most advanced uh, open banking market, I would say. They are even one year or one and a half years ahead of the rest of the uh, the, the Europe. Um, they are projecting a growth uh, to up, up to about 1 billion API calls within this year and then all the way up to early 2021. Um, and there's uh, every, every European Union country has at least 40 registered third party uh, app developers or third-party providers registered so far. Um, and then uh, uh, in the UK alone, there are uh, half of the TPPs are, are from the UK simply because they have a much better standardized API, which makes uh, life of uh, a TPP very easy because they have to just confirm to that particular uh, API spec. Uh, the rest of the Europe has multiple specs and that makes it a little harder uh, for the TPPs in, operating in that part of the part of Europe, but there are other um, there are other companies or other um, uh, fintechs that work as aggregators and make this still um, something that uh, TPPs can easily use. <clears throat> so in the in the UK alone, uh, the UK reached one million consumers using uh, using open banking based applications in January, and and uh, this number is 
expected to double within the next one year uh, and then obviously more than twice as fast as it grew to one uh, one million consumers uh, so close to 100 percent of the current accounts in the uk are uh, now covered by open banking um, and a lot of these uh, usages of open banking are now uh, seen as uh, you know the, the third party applications that are developed are uh, around mortgages personal uh, lending and personal wealth management uh, and things like that uh, and then there are also um, uh, different comparison services and all that as well that is built um, using these open data the data available through these open apis Right, so uh, one, uh, a couple of uh, very interesting examples that I can give you uh, about adoption is that uh, so uh, the regional Australia bank uh, and this uh, fintech called BASIC, uh, they are a fintech specializing in um, insights derived from financial data. Um, so uh, regional Australia bank uses BASIC's services to uh, check a customer's creditworthiness. Um, and uh, they were able to partner and use open APIs to fully automate uh, and, and uh, uh, approve open banking. So Australia's first loan using open banking very recently. And um, uh, the, the, the significance of this is that the, the loan application was received on 1st of July. And then the application was um, uh, processed within a matter of uh, seconds, or sorry, within a matter of minutes and 3,000 transactions were shared between the regional Australia bank and BASIC uh, to do the anal analysis, and, and that transfer took um, mere seconds to happen. Um, and then uh, there was also, uh, um, uh, not only was this uh, uh, fast to process and all that, but the loan applications and all that were, uh, were pre-filled, and the customer experience through this, ex this example was also um, uh, quite very well received. Um, so similarly, in um, in the UK, uh, in November, a beauty salon in Kent um, became the first company to be granted uh, a loan using open banking data uh, through uh, this uh, um, business finance aggregator called Funding Options. Um, so that they basically gather uh, about 40 data points of how a company is performing. So the, 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 the beauty salon was able to obtain a loan of like 10,000 uh, uh, British pounds uh, from uh, Evoca uh, under 90 minutes, right? So that was also a very a noteworthy scenario where um, um, these type of applications are validated, credit checked and processed within a matter of minutes or under, a, you know, within, uh, within uh, uh, maybe an hour or so. Um, whereas, uh, in, if you do it in the traditional sense, this will take a number of days to uh, do days to um, complete. So all this work uh, that uh, all these um, these uh, you know these uh, examples won't work if not for the value the consumers are getting through some of these things. Uh, and and they are, they are now you you are you're starting to see a lot of traction where the cons consumers are eventually seeing. Um, uh, the value in some of these collaborations between banks and fintechs and sharing data through uh, open APIs in this form. Uh, and all of these values are driven through collaborations that happen through, you know, through open APIs and this concept of open banking. Right, so, um, so collaboration is actually the key thing here uh, to make something like this possible and, and add value to the consumers, obviously. Um, so initially, there were a lot of uh, banks that were kind of uh, seeing open banking as like a necessary evil just because it's regulated and they have to be complied, you know, comply to it by they were getting their systems in place and just doing the bare minimum that is required to uh, comply with it. But now banks have realized the potential of it. And I think um, uh, banks are now trying to make use of the 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 things they have, the capabilities they have in delivering new products very quickly to digitally savvy customers, right? This this obviously, as I said before, is um, is done through collaborating with fintechs, um, and uh, the fintechs obviously create different apps that makes the customers' life easy and their customer experience easy, and then um, you know the banks can also thrive in this ecosystem. 
so the small banks see this as a strategic opportunity, opportunity to steal customers from large banks, um, because in all countries you find like an 80-20 split uh, type of situation where you know the the, the big banks have a control large you know large percent of the accounts and the asset base, uh, and then the large banks see this as an opportunity to make most of their existing cost, uh, client base. Uh, and to deliver consumer-centric new digital products, right? To win, uh, for example, younger customers. So uh, through these uh, different apps that fintechs come, uh, you know, um, uh, come up with, banks are able to now reach different customer demographies that they didn't have, they didn't uh, do before, or they didn't have before. Um, and um, yeah, so this is the, this is the power of basically collaboration using technology. Right. So, um, how does how does this uh, how does a bank basically monetize open banking, and uh, how does it uh, create an advantage for itself um, and stand out from the open banking crowd? So, if you think about open banking, uh, once again, uh, regular regulatory open banking APIs basically creates a level playing field for the banks. Um, the, the open APIs are mandatory, they are standardized, and they are, the, the data that's available through them are free of charge. Um, so banks have to share this data, uh, and fintechs can obtain this data, uh, and, and, and that's where things seem to uh, stop, right? But uh, take a note that all of this um, seems to be a level playing field on the surface, but in fact it is not. So uh, uh, so although the open APIs at each bank are the same, there are several factors um, that make certain banks stand out or uh, um, certain banks uh, be better positioned to build strong competitive advantages through open banking than the others. Uh, for example, uh, the historical brand name a bank has and the trust built by a bank. Uh, then the bank's ability to create relationships with fintechs and uh, developers through the through startups and accelerators and that kind of ecosystem that's available nowadays. Then the bank's own digital strategy um, and how they approach digital transformation and digital uh, delivering digital products uh, through partnerships and so on. And then of course the underlying technology. Right, so the underlying technology developed by the banks to publish these open APIs, and the manner in which the banks use these underlying technology, um, is actually what gives the bank a strategic advantage. Right, uh, so the focus of this webinar here on is about this last point, where the technology layers and strategies that a bank can use or the bank can implement to make most out of the technologies available to them, and how do you create a competitive advantage and new revenue streams through open banking from this. One important thing to note here though, is that the success of a bank's digital strategy, uh, the capacity to build networks with fintechs and startup communities and so on, and also creating a strong brand name for itself. Uh, it very much also depends on the underlying technology they have and then what they can do with it so it is the success in this technology that flows through the other factors that also give them the competitive advantage right so let's look at how uh, uh, or what rather a bank can do to differentiate themselves from the rest and start monetizing some of these data and capabilities they have so uh, like we discussed just uh, a few seconds ago, the bank has underlying technology that it may have had for a while or acquired as part of um, being open bank, open banking compliant. Um, so the banks can actually provide premium APIs uh, to add value to fintechs, right? So um, what do we mean by premium APIs? Premium APIs are the APIs that kind of sit above the mandatory regulatory uh, APIs um, and these are uh, uh, these can be used by fintechs on a voluntary on an opt-in opt basis and and the banks are free to build business models around these premium APIs and charge the fintechs for any additional value or functionality that they provide 
right? It is only the open banking APIs that are um, that are um, mandated to be free. The, the the banks can still use these premium APIs to monetize and then um, make a business model for themselves. So uh, the uh, a bank can use these premium premium APIs, for example, to attract high quality partners. Um, so third parties, you can attract third parties like fintechs as a bank um, to work with you, and and you make you make it easier for them to work with you and and you have a culture where you um, welcome collaborations by the fintechs having to do less when they work with you and then you can also provide them with higher quality enriched data um, and uh, these could be uh, in the form of apis or free apis that you provide uh, in addition to the normal open banking open apis that you provide um, and then uh, once again depending if it is rich data that you provide them with um, you you can still um, uh, you 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 are still getting the fintechs to do less here but you also have the option of monetizing this rich data and then making you know building a business model around it as like i said before right and then as a third point you also have this functionality that you've acquired for uh, as part of open banking, for example, um, that you can also monetize and then make it available to other industries um, and then monetize, you know, create monetization avenues through uh, providing functionality as a service. So all of this taken together um, is really ways in which a bank can collaborate with other banks fintechs and other technology providers and in turn create consumer value or value for the consumers in um, delivering more consumer centric products in an agile manner and at scale. So the consumers basically obviously like when you come up with these kind of uh, value propositions for them like financial management, SME accounting, so on and so forth, uh, they benefit obviously through uh, these applications and the services that are, uh, that are offered to them and then in turn there's a there is also a value exchange uh, back and forth between the bank the fintechs and the consumer so the consumers benefit from it um, the fintechs benefit from it and then obviously through these technology uh, channels the banks benefit from it because they are getting now more revenue and uh, more more customers um, so there is meaningful value exchange between all part all parties here and then this these business models obviously become more sustainable as a result Right, so how do you attract great partners? Um, like I said, by helping them to accelerate market entry and for them to do less, right? So how do you give them the chance of less, you know, working less with you? Um, so third-party app developers use various APIs from various providers. Uh, and once they have access to this data through APIs, they need to do some work by themselves to correlate, mash up this data open, uh, you know, obtained by these different sources and then turn this data into some meaningful form for their applications. Uh, so banks can implement additional APIs, like I said before, that enables fintechs to have some of these useful information in addition to the mandatory open banking APIs. These uh, APIs could not only expose additional data, but also data in the form that reduces the amount of work that third parties need to do by themselves. So providing such additional data obviously makes uh, it easier for the third parties to you know, use that data. They, don't, they have to do less work. You're providing them with what they want directly in a consumable form in the application, and therefore they would love to work with you, and they will come back to work with you, right? Uh, so that, collab, that really creates a, a high value for them, and then faster time, time to market also for, for these consumer propositions that you do with the fintech. So let me take an example and, and um, you know, uh, take this case forward. So let's say, for example, a bank has um, uh, these systems that they've, uh, in, they've acquired as part of their open banking solution. Uh, so there are multiple banks, uh, as you see on the screen uh, on, the, on the right hand side. There's three banks that are exposing their uh, account data, payment data as open, uh, through open APIs. So a bank can actually make use of these 
open API uh, data that is available to them as an open API through open APIs, just uh, just working like an aggregator. So they can they can in turn get the data available from the other banks and make use of that through the APIs through the open APIs. They can easily use um, something like a an inter integrator component that may they may have internally to aggregate these this data and then say for example uh, use this data in their internal credit scoring system so you feed that data that you get about a customer from these other banks and feed it into your credit scoring system that has then then that means your your credit scoring algorithm gets more data now to work with and and you can expose the credit scoring uh, the the result of that credit scoring algorithm as a, a, a premium api to your third parties Right, so the bank here uh, works like an aggregator on on one side, getting that data, collaborating with other banks, and then it's using that data in the, in an internal system, and the the output of that internal system now you're providing it as an uh, as a premium API or a value addition to a fintech or a third party that works with you. So that can be exposed through the API management layer uh, as a managed API. Right, so the credit scoring algorithm takes into account all the data submitted, calculates the score, and it is available as a premium API. Right, so uh, if you if you think about this, uh, a, a third-party app developer can actually do all of this by themselves as well. However, this means they have to do all that work by themselves, and then, um, but the bank is actually doing all of that work for them obtaining that data from multiple sources aggregating it and then not only that putting into into a meaningful form running an algorithm and giving them some enriched data there or, or value added uh, data that is directly consumable by the third party application so this uh, as like i said before uh, decreases the time to market of their product right so uh, with that in mind let's uh, Let's look at a short demo how something like this can be implemented using uh, the integration and API management components that you may have. I'm handing over the session to Imad. Um, we are we are going to use uh, WSO2 components here to showcase this uh, brief demo uh, and uh, and uh, explain the uh, uh, this particular use case in a, a little bit more detail. Over to you, Imad. Thanks, Vidya. Yeah, so as Vidura actually went into detail and explained this use case, but so just to give you a brief introduction to what you are looking at. So what you're looking at is uh, an integration that we have built using uh, an integration studio. So this would ideally lie on any bank's integration uh, component of their open banking deployment. So what you are looking at here is uh, uh, an integration sequence that basically captures uh, or sends across, a, it's a scatter gather and enterprise integration pattern where the uh, a request that is sent across to this service that lies on the bank integration or bank back end is basically cloning this request and sending it across to three other banks who are exposing open APIs. So for instance, you can see that this a single request is coming in and it's being cloned into three different endpoints over here. So these would ideally be three different open APIs uh, of three different banks. And what happens is these, once these three requests are sent out, they're basically then captured back and aggregated together. And these uh, responses are combined and they can be identified, like they can be correlated against uh, an aggregation ID, such as an email ID, which was sent across on the original request. And this would aggregate all these responses and then would be fed into the bank's internal credit scoring system so as you can see there's a the an aggregation happening over here and then this basically feeds this into the uh, bank's credit scoring system which will be used by third party providers so if you take a look at then how it would be used and an internal credit scoring system uh, can be exposed as an API once again using the integration components or an integration sequence so in this case the data that we fed lies on the uh, internal credit scoring system so we are utilizing an endpoint a, uh, a restful api to expose this data that is uh, 
in this internal credit scoring system. So for instance, if we were to take a look at how this would uh, happen with a real payload. So if we were to pass along uh, an online banking user, for instance, uh, this user is basically uh, someone who uses the a TPP or an online banking user who would use a TPP application. And this TPP application would then call your uh, internal credit scoring endpoint, which would uh, require an email ID or an identifier. So in this case, I'm just using an email ID to identify this. And when we do send this request across, what happens is the internal credit scoring system is going to attach a credit score based on whatever information it gathered. So the internal credit scoring system was fed from the multiple banks, but ultimately it returned a single credit score based on the internal credit scoring system. So this is one of the more basic scenarios uh, around how you can basically capture all these different responses and utilize these different open APIs of other banks and aggregate all of this into your internal credit scoring and then expose this to a third party provider. So yeah, I think that was just the initial uh, demo that we wanted to show you guys. So over to you Vidra. Right, so um, the second a point that we discussed earlier was uh, provide the partners or the, uh, the app developers or the TPPs with higher quality enriched data. So how do we do this? Uh, once again, uh, so banks can actually collaborate with external partners like other banks like we saw in the earlier scenario. Uh, they can also um, collaborate with uh, say uh, certain uh, SaaS providers or cloud uh, service providers to obtain additional data and capabilities. Um, so these can, these can be used to enrich the data that they already um, expose out uh, and, and, and or, or not just the data, but also the capabilities that they um, expose out. Uh, and this additional data and capabilities can even be monetized and then provided as a value addition to what is already provided through the free data sources. Um, so obviously the third party providers will find these value added APIs very useful. Uh, as they further reduce the amount of work they have to do. It also could be um, information that they, they don't get, get access to easily that is now being provided as a value added, uh, even if it is on the, in a monetized form that the bank is providing them with. So they will obviously happily pay for uh, such an API or the usage of such an API, as long as they, will, they get quality data through um, some of these, uh, you know, some of these these sources. Um, so, of course, doing this um, further enhances the partners and the consumer experience because you are now once again enriching that data to the next level and then providing it to the th third party, uh, uh, third party app developers, and then thereby um, they are able to add that value uh, eventually, pass that value to the to the consumer in the experience they provide them with. So uh, here's a quote from uh, one of the uh, 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 from one of the TPP rep representatives, um, as quoted in this uh, report that is uh, there at the bottom of this slide. Uh, so this this basically goes on to show that uh, yeah, TPPs, uh, if we if if the banks do expose quality data, enriched data through premium APIs. Um, they are willing to they are willing to actually use it. They are willing to pay for it um, And uh, like because they are they are they are sold on the fact that that's going to make their lives very easy So let's go back to let's continue on our example uh, To prove this point as well or to take this forward um, the bank in this case in addition to the the three banks that it's obtaining the the, the, the data through the open APIs um, it can, in this example, it is using an AI-based credit scoring system that is or that is available as a as a cloud service, let's say. But of course, that has a uh, that has a public API that can be used, um, and then that AI-based credit scoring system can potentially look at different aspects that are not covered by the bank's own credit scoring credit scoring system. Now, for example, one trend that we've we've seen in in this arena is that uh, some of the AI based credit scoring systems provide uh, uh, an alternative to just the uh, 
financial history and things like that by uh, considering factors like social media profiles and their activities on social social media and in, in other forms. Um, and uh, they create this alternative credit score for customers. So this this service that this bank can use the this output of the AI based credit score can also be now fed into the bank's own um, credit scoring system uh, and then that data can really increase the accuracy of their own credit scoring algorithm um, when they when they make use of it so how do how does the bank do it once again the integration component that they have can be used to um, call this external uh, rest api uh, obtain that information uh, and then um, that information can be submitted to the credit scoring internal credit scoring system and then the api that you expose out of that uh, to the third parties uh, can now be enriched with that data where you now give a combined credit score that you uh, you uh, sorry your algorithm now takes into con into consideration the ai based credit score as well as your own uh, initial way of uh, you know calculating your credit score and now the third party can be given third parties can be given uh, a combined score as well as the breakdown of the two different scores that they got and and that is a lot more enriched data than just a single credit score that they got in the previous scenario so um, the bank can actually so this this particular ai based credit scoring system may not be a free service after all and the bank might uh, have to pay for this the use of this credit scoring service however this en enriched uh, credit scoring um, api that it provides to the third parties can be monetized by the bank and then you can charge the third parties uh, a fee for usage per invocation this can be facilitated through um, integration with a uh, with a with a billing engine of some sort. So uh, uh, so that's where this API manage the, the billing engine component that you see right on top of the API management component comes into play because the the API that you expose on the API management layer here can then submit uh, so the API management system can submit certain usage data, certain rate plans to a billing engine then allow the bank to um, monetize and then build the third parties for their usage so again this is a value addition to the third parties uh, there's a value addition to the bank as well because it's collaborating with an additional th third party another provider of this ai based credit scoring system and uh, the other good thing is that the bank is now sharing the cost of using that ai based credit scoring system also with the third parties so it, it is not only just spending for that but it's also making money for that usage so that that particular cost of using that ai based credit scoring system is shared across in some form or the other across multiple third parties that are using this uh, monetized api eventually and that can be a cost that may be too much for the third parties to bear if they did all of that on their own. If they were to use this AI based credit scoring system on their own, that may be a hefty cost that they have to um, you know, bear on their own if they direct, used it directly. But here, through the, the value addition that you get from a bank uh, and the APIs that it provides you, now that cost is manageable and, and you're only, only paying as you use it. So it is up to you whether you want to use that service or not directly. Right. So once again, let's look at a short demo of how this can be done, uh, you know, in using the components that a bank may have uh, in its, um, you know, in internal um, technical platform. Uh, over, over to you again, Iman. Thanks, Vidra. Yeah. So again, once again, we're looking at an integration sequence over here from the integration component that would exist on the bank deployment. So what you're looking at here is like Vidru mentioned and uh, a more enriched form or an advanced form of the credit scoring. So where we could possibly talk to uh, an external credit scoring, an AI based credit scoring application or a service provider. So as you can see in this sequence, it's, it's an API. 
and it's it's doing a, an external call to uh, an ai based credit scoring uh, provider so this may be a saas provider or it can be anything like that so the the bank would basically integrate with this external service provider and it would pass along any request it gets and get gets an external credit score for a given customer and this external credit score would then be fed into the internal credit scoring system and what would happen is you can again consolidate both of these uh, credit scores and give you know an advanced kind of credit score for uh, you know an enriched data use or basically for tpps to uh, have value addition over their existing credit scoring apis so this would basically consolidate the responses that we get from this external credit scoring application as well as our internal credit scoring application so an example for an api that would look like this is uh, you would send across some information like your standard online banking use id as well as a unique identifier for your external uh, credit scoring for this external credit scoring application or provider to identify who this person is so it could be a government level identification like a national id or such and what would happen is this would then be fed across into the internal credit scoring system and would return a consolidated response or a consolidated credit score so for instance we have an advanced credit score probably coming in from uh, both of these and there may be some logic that exists to uh, basically give across an advanced credit score and then we have the ai based credit score from the third party as well and then we could have any additional information that we have retrieved from the uh, ai based credit scoring provider as well like a social media score and it basically can uh, consolidate all of this information and give the tpp an enriched value so if you were to look at the managed how we could manage this api and think about monetizing it so if you were to take a look at the publisher portal from the api management platform we have our internal credit scoring api and we have the advanced credit scoring api which are both available on the bank back end so what we could do is we could create a form of api product where we could bundle together both these resources so for instance if i if you take a look at this enriched credit scoring solution uh, it's it's a form of credit, uh, it's an api product that has bundled both of these together so if you were to take a look at how this is happens we could create an api product that uh, says this is going to be an enriched api product which contains the resources for both of these apis so when we are going to create this api product what we could do is we can attach something known as a business plan to it so this business plan i have already created something for the purposes of this demo so this business plan is what uh, where we attach our monetization plan so for instance we have different tiers over here and as you can see i have one monetization tier which says pay as you go which is a dynamic usage monetization plan and it says it's one dollar per request i have uh, given a high value for ease of this demo so what happens is if you attach this monetization plan this api product when it is invoked it would basically utilize this monetization plan and dynamically charge the uh, tpp who invokes this api or api product so the next step would basically be to select what apis you're going to bundle into this api product so in this scenario what i'm going to do is i'm going to be bundling the internal credit scoring api which we i showed you previously in our previous demo so we can bundle across the resource endpoint for the internal credit scoring api as well as our advanced credit scoring api so the tpp has the option to use either one and it would anyway be a monetized api and we could simply publish this across so i have already published one of these api products previously before we started this so we have an enriched credit scoring application over here and if you take a look at the management perspective on how we monetize it so we have an option to monetize this api and you can enable your you have to enter your stripe monetization key over here so this is basically the uh, monetization account id of the tpp so what happens is every time a tpp subscribes to this api product this monetization account key would be mapped across and he would be charged uh, as per the monetization commercial policy and if you were to uh, basically then say how it basically maps out together is it would be able to be from the from the developer portal you would be able to see what kind of invoice you are generating across uh, this api product so what we're looking at now is the developer portal 
so the developer portal is where TPPs would come along and create virtual applications to subscribe to API's so if you take a look here I have the default application as well as something known as a credit scoring application so if I go into this credit scoring application and head along to subscriptions I have subscribed to this enriched credit scoring API so every time I now invoke this enriched credit scoring API from this credit scoring app it would then trigger uh, it would basically trigger a, a call to stripe monetization and it would basically generate an invoice for me so upon usage what happens is we have the capability to see how many API calls have gone across and the TPPs are able to see what kind of invoice they have available similarly on the stripe dashboards as well this would be visible in the form of an invoice for a TPP where they can see how much of usage they have gone across you know the number of API calls for instance and an ultimate invoice so this is just how we can enable uh, you know the enriching of data and you know monetizing your API's and building a product out of it so yeah that covers what I wanted to demonstrate so over to you Vidura thanks Ivan All right, so let's continue on. Um, yeah, so then with that, we move to the third particular, the third point that we uh, discussed earlier on. Um, that is, uh, the banks may have um, acquired certain ad additional functionality or uh, technical capabilities uh, as part of um, being compliant to open banking, uh, or it may have had some of these things anyway. Um, and then uh, there is also an option for a bank to provide partners and provide even other industries uh, with with these functionalities and then monetize those functionalities as well. So basically the banks can provide these functionalities as a service to to other other uh, other partners or other third parties. And this allows them basically that the people who use these additional functionalities from um, from the banks it allows them to really focus on what focus on what they do best uh, and then let these uh, providers take care of all of that for you um, right so uh, so for example now as part of the open banking uh, banks may have acquired uh, capabilities like uh, such as strong customer authentication uh, consent management uh, these are all um, features that are mandated by regular regulation uh, but these can these capabilities can can be can be like common technologies for sharing data sharing functionalities um, you know um, uh, managing the consent of sharing data identifying uh, uh, or authenticating a user uh, who they claim to be uh, uh, and and that is really tied up with the sharing of data uh, you know through apis for any industry uh, so uh, like i said these capabilities can be provided as a service to the third parties and and they can be you know there can be many who are looking for similar capabilities um, and and that may result in additional collaborations for the bank um, as well as uh, additional revenue streams so you, like if you if you provide this service and then you monetize this functionality uh, and and charge them a fee for for the for the services or the functionalities they use um, they get so the third parties get bank grade functionality at low cost right and and then the bank also uh, is able to uh, have additional income sources and then also make most out of what they already have uh, so this is once again a win-win for, for both parties so uh, let me take an example uh, like uh, you know uh, like the previous cases and and, and uh, explain this further. Uh, so let's assume that uh, uh, so uh, a bank has having this strong customer authentication uh, uh, of service or, or capabilities in their identity and access management product. Uh, then uh, it also has this consent management features in in uh, in its uh, uh, in its platform. Um, so there is a medical clinic. A customer goes and gets treatment in, at the medical clinic. The medical clinic has a, men, a medical information system that has the patient records and about what they were treated for, uh, the you know the charges associated with that, so on and so forth. Now the the customer wants to 
go and get their their insurance provider to basically pay for this treatment uh, now here is a classic case where once again the medical clinic has that data and that data can be shared with the insurance provider through apis of some sort right uh, now uh, obviously it can't just do that without the consent of the patient um, and this is especially important in the post gdpr world where uh, you know similar regimes are even coming across globally like uh, lgb lgpd in in uh, um, in brazil uh, acquiring consent and uh, secure, securely authenticating the patient is like a uh, it's a must to uh, share this information and it's generally not part of an api management solution so for example if uh, the medical information system that the medical clinic has the capability to expose this data they may not have the capability to authenticate the customer in a strong a strong customer authentication way as well as managing that consent in in the form that is required by some of these rules that are to do with privacy and sharing of medical uh, records and data and all of that so the bank can actually provide this service uh, using its internal uh, identity and access management capabilities as well as the consent management capabilities um, and then uh, that saves the medical clinic having to make a huge investment on some of these parts and then just use it for uh, in a pay as you go model um, so what what will happen here if you if you do this collaboration with the insurance provider being the third party uh, app developer uh, the medical clinic being the the data holder and the bank being the uh, provider of this functionality as a service so how how does this work practically something similar to this, right? Uh, I hope this is uh, this can be read by everybody, everybody there. Uh, basically, in the insurance provider will have an app. The, the, the end user will, whose, whose um, medical records are held by the clinic, will have to log into that app and has to initiate that login. That will get redirected. If, bank, if the bank is providing this uh, strong customer authentication service, that will, so when, when this, um, authentication uh, has to be done or when the user login is initiated that will get redirected into the bank's iam system right and then it will go through the first factor second factor at least and then maybe additional factors if it is configured like that and then once the authentication is completed and the identity is established then the api call will happen from the insurance provider app to the medical information system api uh, api that's available there so there is an api invocation going and internally what the medical information system will now do is that it will check for patient consent in its uh, you know in, in its uh, systems so it will obviously have some record if the patient consent was previously given and if so whether it's still valid or not there can be an expiry date associated with that if it doesn't have that consent then it will uh, contact the bank's consent management system and then that will result in a redirect where the, cust the, the end customer now is shown a screen where it shows them the, the, the data that is about to be shared with the, uh, the, the insurance provider and also a place for them to uh, submit their consent. Right. So once they give their consent, it is re redirected back to the bank's consent management system that's that's where the consent is recorded right so then the consent is securely stored inside the consent management system and then some sort of reference that is completely pseudonymized or anonymized will be passed to the medical information system for to keep as a record when the consent was given and how long it is valid for and that will enable the medical information system now to re give the or share the data through the api with the insurance provider right so this is sort of how that will work there is multiple parties involved the app developer the data holder and the service provider right and of course there's the patient who's also a customer uh, you know of the bank as well as the insurance uh, provider as well as the medical clinic right so once again 
let's look at a, a sample scenario that kind of mimics this um, uh, again, which we have built. Uh, I'll hand it over to Imad once again for that. Thanks, Hidra. So what we're looking at on the screen right now is what a patient or a customer of this insurance application would see on his insurance app. So this is a sample app that we built to mimic that entire scenario and just showcase how it would be from a strong customer authentication and uh, you know utilizing the strong customer authentication and consent management components of the bank framework and basically reusing these components. So for instance, if a patient or a customer of this Acme insurance wants to basically provide his details or his account information or his balances or any statement details that he wants to provide to this uh, you know patient management system what would happen is we would uh, this insurance application can reuse the consent management and strong customer authentic authentication components that exist on the bank uh, identity framework so what happens when i do click this button as a patient is if there is no consent that has previously been given to acme insurance uh, from the consent management system it would ask him to authenticate himself and this is the first step in this entire flow where it would authenticate himself as you know the the bank exposes an api and an authentication endpoint is exposed and then the patient has to authenticate himself at this endpoint so for instance over here what happens is if i authenticate myself i would then be uh, I would then have to go through a strong customer authentication phase where I would have to go through different factors of authentication. It can be a single factor, second, or even a third factor, depending on how it is configured. So in this case, I have a two-factor authentication system in place, uh, including an SMS OTP, for instance. So if I were to enter this code as well, what would happen now is after the user or the patient is authenticated, he would then be redirected to a consent management uh, display or a consent management UI where he needs to then provide his consents for whatever data is being requested. So in that case, we requested four sets of permissions. So what happens is the bank would then expose a consent management screen to as a service or basically if anyone wants to make use of this consent management and all the permissions that were requested by the uh, you know the insurance application is then prompted on this consent management ui and the patient has the capability to take a look at these uh, permissions and he has the capability to authorize or deny these uh, permissions by this insurance uh, application so if i authorize this what happens is then the insurance application has a uh, has the access to this data and has the capability to access this patient's data and what would happen is the patient management system would also have a, a reference of this consent that has been provided and the insurance application can then talk to the bank or the patient management system with this consent id and take along this you know different uh, account data that exists of this specific patient so this is how it would all uh, play out in a in an actual scenario yeah so that's what I just wanted to demonstrate. Over to you, Vidra. Thanks, Iman. Right, so let's uh, move on. So, um, so now you've seen the three um, strategies that we spoke about even in the blog post. Um, and uh, so what we what we want to highlight here is now how do you go from concept to action to open banking maturity from here on. Um, so uh, a, a recap. Now we uh, we spoke briefly about um, the underlying technology being the driving factor here for the digital strategy, the capacity building uh, to building the networks as well as the brand. Um, here you so what we've tried to show with this demo so far is the the technology that um, how 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 you can use what you have if you're a bank to kind of have a digital strategy for yourself how do you collaborate how do you have have more ways of collaborating with the with the partners that you have and then building your brand by um building and and allowing uh, the fintechs also to 
add more value to the customer experience you're providing to your customers, basically. Uh, so, um, a, a few additional points here that uh, I think um, that will come uh, useful when you have an API-led strategy is that there are API best practices that can further strengthen some of these collaborations and help in uh, agile delivery of the digital products, right? So, these some of these things can really cut down the time to market. Now, some of these examples are uh, if you practice API-first design, uh, the API first design enables uh, you to so basically API first design is all about uh, not waiting for the not having to wait for the backend services that you're exposing to be ready uh, for you to come up with the API. So you you may even have multiple teams in your banks, one working on the backend service, one working on the API, and then exposing that API early on to potential API consumers and even giving them a a feel of how uh, this API is right, and then why? Why is that important? Because you're you're engaging them early on, and then you're also giving them a flavor of what we expect. And with their feedback, you can even uh, reshape your strategy or the API's uh, API's output to be a lot more useful to them. Um, then, so what? What make make this possible? Now, for example, API prototyping as a concept allows you to mock out the backends and then give this realistic um, feel to the uh, to the API consumers who are using your APIs. Then uh, one additional important uh, aspect is API lifecycle management. So API lifecycle management is all about uh, API producers having the ability to rolling, roll out changes and enhancements to the APIs without disrupting the API usage uh, of the existing, existing uh, API users. Um, there could be mechanisms that you follow for API discovery and trying out. So if you're giving a chance for a potential user to discover your API through some sort of portal, uh, easier way of uh, easier way of um, uh, searching for it, uh, making documentation and everything available to them, and giving them the ability even to try out that prototype API without having to really subscribing to it, then that invites a lot of potential collaborators to try it out and then um, you know engaging with you thereafter and then you can also promote your apis through social media integrations discussion forums and um, you know free tryout facilities and all that and then you can also make sure that you provide sdks uh, that allows app developers to use their favorite development platform to um, you know build the application to still and and still be able to use your uh, apis Right, so um, we have a brief demo uh, just to touch on some of these aspects as well. I'll quickly hand over to uh, Imar to run through this as well. Thanks, Sudra. So yeah, so let me quickly run through, starting from the API first design, which we which we spoke about. So as you know, uh, a bank, you, if you have the capability to quickly prototype APIs that you want TPPs to try out and you know get some traction from them and you want them to experience what your apis would look like when they're ultimately done so if you have it's good to have the capability to uh, for instance provide a mock backend in the form of uh, you know without having your actual backends up and running so having the capability to prototype these or script these backends uh, like with dummy responses and have the capability for tpps to come along and try them out and is very important so for instance, we have the capability to uh, go along and check your uh, API endpoints and you can see different types of endpoint types. So we can have a prototype endpoint which basically where you can script your implementation. So in this case, if you take a look at one of these endpoint resources, what happens is you can script what your endpoint is actually going to look like in case of a, a 200 response or you know any type of other response. And you can tell TPPs that this is what you are ultimately going to be exposing when your API is ready. So TPPs can come along and try these APIs out based on these uh, prototype implementations. And if we were to take a look at the life cycle, so we can deploy these APIs as prototypes initially, and we can then move them into, uh, once your actual backends are ready, we can move them into your HTTP backends or your REST backends and so on. And then we also have the API life cycle by itself. So an API by default is usually in its created state 
and we can also have this moved on to a prototype and then on to a published stage for actual TPP usage. So this is one really good aspect of seeing that. And then we also have the developer store. So let me take a look at, let's take a look at the developer store quickly. So the developer store is where TPPs would come along and it acts as a service discovery portal for third party providers to come and discover your API. So it can be a prototype API or it can be a production API for instance. And TPPs can use this to, you know, search for APIs by different tags. So, for instance, I have credit scoring APIs and I can have different tags based on my APIs that I'm exposing. And also, like Vitru mentioned, you know, having the capability to, do, uh, to view documentation of these APIs. So, for instance, a bank can, uh, when publishing an API, the bank internal team can describe what this API is going to be about. So, for instance, the internal credit scoring can be used to check credit scores and you can document your API and tell TPPs what to expect when they are going to utilize these APIs. We also have the capability to uh, having the capability to basically check on you know things like use of forums and you know uh, getting TPPs to engage with your APIs and getting them to discuss with each other. This is also a possibility and uh, is very important aspect as well. And then we also have the capability to uh, take a look at different software development kits that are available. So providing these SDKs for your TPPs to make use of, you know, providing different languages so that they simply download client libraries and are able to invoke your APIs uh, quickly and get traction. Yeah, over to you, Vidura. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Imad. Right. So um, let me switch back my slides yep uh, yeah so this slide actually gives you an overview of all the best practices that we just uh, discussed so I'm not going to spend time on it in the interest of time so I'm going to move on to uh, the next one so what we've seen so far in the in the in the last bit of the demo is that um, so you might just quickly uh, took you through the publisher and the developer portal the publisher portal is for the API publishers or the API product uh, creators the dev portal is for the third parties or the API consumers. So uh, you have the capability even with the very basic version of a product, if you have these kind of portals to do all of these, uh, uh, you know, to create a small platform or create a platform for collaboration between the, the, the third parties that you're providing these APIs for as well as, uh, you know, um, um, providing, you know, having these features such as um, uh, integration with billing engines uh, and and things like that. Uh, so by the way, when we when we showed our uh, the demo, we we showed that integration uh, that we have with Stripe. But you don't have to, you know, we we support other billing engines uh, out of the box as uh, sorry out, out of the box. We only su support Stripe, but we support other billing engines as well with a with minor customization. So you you can actually use uh, any of the billing engines that are out there with uh, you know with uh, with our products um, but uh, so so the uh, the idea here is that you build some sort of a portal starting off with the publish and the dev portal where you have your apis promote your apis let the uh, the consumers try it out and then um, discover them and and then start using them um, so then initially you might have only your apis but you can then open this up to all the other types, other other uh, other third parties that you collaborate with, like the other banks, like the a, the the APIs that you as a bank uses, right? So if you have if you use these collaborations and get them onto this common platform, you can build what is known as an API marketplace around these two portals. These two portals have uh, all the necessary capabilities that you need to build a marketplace. Uh, and the marketplace can eventually have not only your own APIs, but APIs that are from external sources, your partners, third parties, uh, and then different types of APIs. It doesn't have to be just APIs that provide, uh, you know, financial uh, services only. It can be any services that are attached to it, like, uh, you know, hospitality or travel or anything like that as well. Um, and then you can establish this this marketplace and make it a collaborative space for multiple uh, multiple parties and you also have the option of even monetizing that usage as a bank and then making you know a, a creating a revenue stream stream out of the 
the the the marketplace itself uh, so in a, in a nutshell it will look look like something like this where uh, you have the the developer so everything is built around the developer portal where you have the apis listed you have the documentation the forums the sdks the searching capabilities like we showed you earlier um, and testing capabilities try out the apis and all of that and this developer portal can have apis from different parties uh, including the bank as well as other other parties that they collaborate with uh, and then you can uh, so the api producers will obviously publish the apis here the consumers will come here discover it and then um, uh, start consuming uh, but the the cool thing here is that uh, anybody who uses this as a publisher can now also use this this marketplace as a uh, as a vehicle to promote the apis by having things like hackathons um, then competitions workshops uh, evangelism activities that are centered around this um, this portal simply because this has all the capabilities that are that are needed uh, to attract people let them try out discover and then use and of course this whole concept of the marketplace can be uh, obviously will be backed by the api management runtime uh, as well as the policy enforcement engine uh, that will enforce things like security throttling and governance policies that are there Right, so um, lastly, um, just to talk a little bit about um, uh, what WSO2 Open Banking offers uh, out of the box. So we've, we've worked with multiple banks around the globe, uh, Europe, Australia, uh, a lot uh, in these regions to comply with open banking standards. And then um, we've, we are also now looking at the Brazilian and the Mexican um, uh, uh, because those, those uh, Markets are also now looking at um, regulated APIs and things like that. Uh, and we've helped all of these banks achieve compliance and also um, you know, implement some commercial use cases. So even the unregulated areas in the world, like for example, the Middle East, the Gulf, they have started, uh, they have started adopting some of these very well known um, global standards like the Open Banking UK, a standard because it is it is proven now and it is there it has been there for a while and it's widely used so some of these regions uh, are, are starting to reuse some of the uh, the standards that are accepted in other parts of the world uh, then of course this this uh, WSO2 open banking platform has all the capabilities that we've discussed today in this webinar um, it is built on top of the industry leading API platform as well as the identity and access management platform that we have uh, and the integration platform that we have and it allows it has these capabilities to enable premium open banking features um, you know uh, to the, to anybody who uses this uh, and then these these products that we've built the open banking solution um, has been widely recognized by Forrester Gartner uh, in their in their um, in their reports and in their magic quadrants as as leaders visionaries and things like that um, you know multiple times uh, across the you know across the years uh, we also support um, quite a lot of uh, these deployment models where uh, you may be looking at something futuristic like microservices based cloud native architectures that are you know built using containerization and everything so we we support most of these things out of the box as well and and our products can be deployed anywhere on the cloud on premise or hybrid uh, so other than all of these other than you know helping you to design and build all of these solutions we also uh, offer consultancy on op optimizing your opt uh, open banking deployment uh, exploring commercial aspects uh, such as monetization and then uh, like we have you we have helped so many other uh, customers uh, like the you know some of the customers we work with are, are in the fortune 500 list uh, so we can empower your internal teams with the required knowledge uh, and help align your internal culture uh, to be a lot more digital collaborative agile driven culture um, and then um, uh, help you to reduce the time to market and get these digital products uh, with added value to your end customers um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, I think we've gone about five minutes or ten minutes over time. Um, but um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them.
so one one question was uh, i think i i answered uh, previously uh, the monetization services that are available uh, so we have out of the box uh, monetization capabilities with integration with stripe uh, but uh, using our product you can uh, integrate with other billing engines as well uh, we have extension points uh, to integrate with other products uh, um, other billing engines and so on so how how, how this works is like what Imad showed you you can uh, you can define a rate plan that gets uh, that uh, gets uh, submitted to uh, you know uh, the, the billing engine and our uh, our product has an analytics engine that collects all the usage data and that gets submitted to the billing engine and then that's how you get eventually your uh, invoice for their usage um, so like that we have uh, we you know we have uh, uh, we have uh, we support that kind of thing uh, you know uh, out of the box as well uh, so another question that I just got um, uh, do we have uh, next gen PSD2 standard ready out of the box Berlin group standard yes absolutely uh, we have customers who are using Berlin group uh, APIs with our product uh, we have um, yeah we have um, uh, we have support for that um, and then uh, if you if you go to the the landing page on our website you can get a little bit more information but we can also send you some information uh, on this um, as to um, what version we support and all of that um, but yes the short answer is yes we do support Berlin group and we have customers who use Berlin group standard with us um, then um, there is also a, a, a question about uh, how our uh, solutions can solution can scale. Uh, so um, when you start using APIs, you may not have a lot at the beginning. So we have a very unique uh, deployment model where we allow uh, our users to start small. Um, we even even the the API management component can run uh, uh, in a in a very a small scale deployment of just two nodes. Uh, so all the capabilities that you saw here, the gateway capability, the developer portals, uh, the, the policy enforcement, like the security, the secure token service, and all of that uh, can be can be run in that mode. Uh, and then uh, when you get more and more traffic, you have the ability to scale it out. You can scale out your gateways. You can scale out um, then your you are the other components the usual uh, method is you scale out your gateways and then you start scaling out your key manager component or the sts secure token service uh, and then the other components and all that so you have multiple ways of deploying it you can um, uh, you know scale it uh, uh, you don't have to go fully distributed full blown uh, straight up you start off small and then as you get more and more traffic you can uh, slowly increment the uh, you know the deployment right um, yeah so I, as we have run out of time uh, what we'll do is we'll wrap up for now uh, and then if anybody else who has questions we will reach out um, to the folks who have asked questions and then provide them with answers uh, and then feel free uh, to um, so we will share this presentation uh, and and the recording and uh, all of that with you feel free to reach out to me or Imad or uh, on email or any other way um, uh, if you have any questions about uh, any of the concepts that we discussed here uh, and then um, uh, any of uh, you know any any features that you want to know about our, our solution or our products that we offer um, and there is also a, a, a short survey with uh, we'd appreciate if you can uh, fill out that survey as well uh, it will help us uh, to do things better uh, and and provide you with uh, you know better webinars and better information uh, next time we do something um, and uh, I think uh, the, the 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 survey is fairly short it will take about a, a minute or two maximum for you to fill uh, and then uh, that will that will be shown to you right after this webinar and we'll really appreciate if you can share you know um, fill that and share that with you uh, thanks. Um, uh, thank you everybody and then uh, um, we hope to connect again through a similar uh, webinar in the future. Thank you um, and have a good day.